I just want to briefly show you a little bit about uh, Spartan. So So let's like look at a trigonal bipyramid. Um, so we have something that looks like this. You can see you have these one, two, three atoms in one plane, and then you have one on the top, one on the bottom. So you have this trigonal bipyramid. And I just want to walk you through the shapes of you know what happens when you convert one of the bonding to a non-bonding. So if I delete one of these bonds there, uh, I have a seesaw. Right? So now I have two on the axis, one on the top, one on the bottom. Looks like a little seesaw. And then I'm going to remove another one from the um, equatorial positions around the equator, and now I have a T-shape, and if I remove one more, now I have a linear atom. You can do the same thing with a um, octahedral arrangement. So here we have something like sulfur hexafluoride, so SF6. Um, you can see all the bond angles there are 90, right, no matter which way you go, and if you deleted any one of these, now you have a uh, a square pyramid and then if you get rid of the one opposite of where you just lost the other one now you have a square planar so those angles are all 90 um, and then trigonal by pyramid you have 90 and 120 and this program can actually calculate the the bond angles for you um, if you just go to geometry and then like measure angle and then you click on three it'll show you what the bond angle is in the corner Okay, if I shrink it down a little bit, you can see down here in the corner, it'll tell you that's that's a 90 degree bond angle. Um, and if you want to do it again, geometry, measure this angle. Let's go from here to here to here, and that's 120. So the bond angles are 120 uh, along the equator, and then 90 uh, when you're talking, uh, talking about the axial positions. The Spartan is a good way to uh, look at the polarity of molecules as well, and you're going to do that in the lab. So what is polarity? Uh, you've already talked about it in terms of bonds. We have like a bond dipole, um, which is really like a separation of charge. Right. So if we had something um, like carbon, there we go, carbon dioxide. I can look at the polarity of each one of these bonds and say that oxygen is more um, electronegative than carbon, so this side's going to be a little more positive, this side's going to be a little more negative, right? The partial, partially negative charge on the oxygen looks like that. And then the same thing's happening over here. So I can look at the polarity of the bonds, and then I can use the bonds, the bond polarity, as well as the shape, the geometry of the molecule to talk about the, the dipole moment. How, how, you know, overall, is this molecule polar or nonpolar? And if it's nonpolar, then those basically those um, dipole moments or the the polar bonds are going to cancel each other out. If it's um, polar, then they don't cancel out. So if you think about these 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 uh, dipoles as uh, vector quantities, right? They have magnitude, they have direction. Um, you can kind of add them all up, all these vector quantities. You can add them all up to figure out if overall the molecule is polar or nonpolar. So in this case, the way I like to think about these things is if you're, suppose you're playing tug of war and you're the carbon and you have, uh, you know, two people, which are the oxygens on both sides of you, and they're both pulling with the exact same force and you're right in the line, you're linear, you're not going to move at all. But what if you had something like, so that's carbon dioxide, those forces cancel each other out and that's going to make this thing nonpolar. But something like water which looks like this, right? When you draw in those, those vectors, again, oxygen is more electronegative, so I'm going to draw these little arrows pointing towards the more electro electronegative part. Hydrogen is more positive. If I pull here in this direction, um, now if I pull on both sides of these, uh, they don't cancel out, and you're going to have a net, um, net pull you know, in, in this direction if I added those up. Towards the towards the oxygen, or if or imagine you're standing there and you have two kids, one pulling on each one of your legs, they're probably going to pull you down because they're overall going to be a net force in the downward direction in, in that case. Um, so they don't cancel out. So if you have something that's linear and you're pulling the exact same force on both sides, you're going to have something that's nonpolar. If you have something bent here, 
um, this is going to be polar because those forces don't uh, cancel each other out. Uh, here's an example. So if you have something like HCl, HCl is linear, but the chlorine is more electronegative than the hydrogen, so they don't cancel each other out. So that would be something uh, that was polar. And that's, you can, you can tell by just figuring out the electronegativity differences between the H and the Cl. And if it's in a certain range, just like we did in chapter 8, then it would be polar. And if it's not, then it would be nonpolar. Um, now, if you had something like oops, C, Cl4, something tetrahedral that's completely symmetric. So even if I have polar bonds or nonpolar bonds, they all cancel each other out because this is going to be completely symmetric. No matter how I pull it, I'm pulling the same force in all directions and it's going to cancel out. Um, let's see, how about NH? Let's try NH, uh, NH3. I have nitrogen, something like this. I have lone pairs here. So you may start to notice a trend. When you have lone pairs, be careful. <laughs> be careful um, because then that's a lot of times it'll, it'll make that polar. Not always, but a lot of times this thing, um, your molecule will be polar if you have lone, lone pairs. Yeah, so symmetries will help. Um, if you have a central atom that's surrounded by you know four of the exact same things here, like this carbon tetrachloride, um, you know, you're pulling with the exact force in all directions, all those vectors are going to cancel each other out, as long as there's no lone pairs. If you have lone pairs there, then uh, that will change the dynamics. And so this guy is polar, this one over here is nonpolar. So in order to figure out if something's polar or nonpolar, um, I'm going to show you a little, a little cheat sheet next, and that will help us. So Actually, do a couple more examples and then I'll try to break it down. So HCl, draw the Lewis structures. Remember how to draw Lewis structures. So this guy is linear. It's linear, but um, chlorine is more electronegative than the hydrogen, so this guy is going to be polar. I did SO2. Something like this. So this has whoops, one, two, three electron domains. Um, this is trigonal. This is the trigonal planar is the electron domain geometry, and bent is the molecular geometry. Um, so because this is bent, let me go in this direction. And overall, you have a net pull down. So this guy uh, will also be polar. And it's bent. SF6 is octahedral. You can draw on all the dots if you want to. We have already seen this one a million times. Um, so this is nonpolar because it's completely symmetric and all of the vectors are going to cancel each other out. So this is nonpolar. NF3 looks a lot like NH3 that we had up there. All right, so this is going to be polar. And then BCl3, remember boron, is one of the exceptions to the rule, uh, the octet rule. It's happy just having three um, bonds or six electron pairs. So this guy is nonpolar because everything's going to cancel. So if you have lone pairs around your central atom, a lot of times you end up with something that is um, polar. No, it's polar. So just to summarize um, the shapes and make some, some generalities here, um, this is in the, the exam study guide that you can find online. So if you have two electron domains, you're linear, as long as the central atom, um, it, I'm sorry, the two, the two like outside atoms are exactly the same, then uh, your linear molecule will be nonpolar. So if you're in electron domain two, so that would be nonpolar. Now, if you had something that was trigonal planar and everything was the same around it, that's also going to be nonpolar. If you had something that was bent in this, right, once you have those, lo those lone pairs on it, now this thing is going to be polar. 
Um, for this one, as long as everybody's the same on the outside, this is going to be nonpolar for a tetrahedral. For a uh, trigonal pyramid, where are we? I think this is a typo. This should be like a nitrogen in here with a lone pair. That would give it four electron domains. That would be polar. Uh, this one, a bent one, is also polar. And then down here, you have a trigonal bipyramid. This guy is going to be nonpolar all the, because it's completely symmetric. This only holds true if everything on the outside is the same. Um, if you have a difference in pull, like suppose you had something oh, not electronegative here, but everybody else is fluorine that's really electronegative, then this could be polar. Um, this one would be polar, and this one would be polar. Uh, trick, once you get down here, now you're back to linear, and that's going to be nonpolar. So even though you have all these lone pairs here, this is an exception to the rule. But remember this one, it's weird. Um, it's still linear. All those lone pairs there the kind of cancel out. You're all, they don't really factor into it. They're forcing these other two atoms to be 180 degrees from each other. But then as long as this one is the same as that one, those forces are going to cancel out. Octahedral is also nonpolar. Square pyramid would be polar. And then here's another weird one where you have lone pairs right on the top and the bottom, but this ends up being nonpolar. So that's kind of your cheat sheet on how to do this. I apologize for the typo on this um, document. I'm going to have to change that.